the reason why I think these stories are interconnected is that there's a sort of plague on all their houses mm. mood around, and there has been for a long time. And I think you can see symptoms of this all over the place. Uh, the rise of the SNP in Scotland, the decline of the Labour Party in Scotland, the failure of Cameron to win an overall majority. We've got a hung parliament. Last time we had one, 74, in an economic crisis. Um, there are lots of examples of this. And you'd throw and, Brad Bradford, presumably, and into And Bradford the mix is there, the right? later symptom, where Labour did badly, but the other, it was bad for the other two mainstream parties as well. The Lib Dems lost their deposit. In previous eras, they might have hoped to win such a seat on the back of a protest vote. So all three parties at the moment are being challenged by events. One of them will get their act together at some point, as happened in the late 70s. But at the moment, and it's been since really 2008, um, I didn't think any party would win an overall majority at the last election. As things stand, I don't think anyone will at the next. We're in sort of hung parliament territory. And during that period, all kinds of strange things are going to happen but, in by-elections and other... The new Labour era became famous, bizarrely in some ways, for this label spin. And as it was drawing to a close, I thought, I think this is going to carry on somehow. And I'll tell you why I thought that. I was invited by David Cameron to go on this train journey with him to Norwich. But something very weird happened to me with David Cameron. I never got invited to Chequers or anything like that. But I was always invited to join him on a train to Norwich. It happened three times. I've never understood, I've never understood why, but there must have been some sort of grid where my name came up next to Norwich somehow. But anyway, on one of these trips, it was about 18 months before the general election, I was on this train with him to Norwich. And he got a call on his mobile phone. And he was sort of had been fairly tired and looked kind of, you know, as if this was all a bit too much. And this phone call said, what? It was from his office. Oh, that is fantastic. Really? Oh, I'm so happy. Oh, let the sun shine. That's marvellous, marvellous, marvellous. Thank you so much, George, for telling me that. Oh, I'm so thrilled. And he put the phone down. He said to um, his press woman who was with her, get some wine. We're all going to have a drink. This is absolutely fantastic. I thought, what the heck's going on here? Has he heard that Samantha is pregnant? Or I don't know, that the polls now give him a 30-point lead. And so he said, well, what are we celebrating? He said, I've just heard Simon Heffer's been sacked from the Daily Telegraph. <laughs> and um, Tony Benn's diary is a classic. He chronicled everything on a day-by-day -day basis. Rather like Alistair, actually, late, at, late in the evening, in a slightly different way. He used a tape recorder to record everything. And there's a wonderful vignette of a cabinet meeting in about 1975, maybe 1976. The end of the sort of Wilson era. Wilson now completely paranoid about everything, uh, especially his own cabinet, with good cause, actually. Um, and uh, Wilson called this cabinet meeting, and Ben says... Harold was absolutely strict with us. He said, if there are any more leaks to the media, the relevant cabinet minister will be sacked on the spot. Harold said he's had enough of leaks, they are utterly damaging, and they must stop now or else. Anyway, the cabinet took a break at midday, and I went out and saw, bought the first edition of the Evening Standard with a cup of tea. And the front page story was, Wilson warns cabinet over leaks. <laughs> Harold leaked the fact that, uh, anyway, you can get the rest.